Good morning, afternoon or evening. Be it Sunday or Monday or even Saturday night. Whoever, wherever and whenever you are watching this, you are more than welcome. So come join us here at the Peninsula Churches as we worship together, as we worship God. Let us bring our world into this place, into the messy faith that is love, and find here in this place the messy story of God, who finds us here in this place, messed up and confused by life, let us find here in this place a way to hold the mess in worship and hope. And find here in this place, amongst the mess, a God who reaches in and saves us. Amen. Let us worship together, even though we are apart. Come, let's sing to the rock of ages. Worship him, joyful and contagious.
Now let us pray. Eternal mystery, source of all that is and lover of all that has its life in you. We humans are forever trying to tie you down, to keep you for ourselves. We are God's chosen people, we say. And you, with a smile, reply, yes, indeed you are. And so are they. And these, and especially those whom you call enemies, heretics, other, unclean. And we have seen the light, we say, and you with a broad grin draw back the shade and dazzle us into blindness. And then it's time to play our trump card. We have the word of life. There's thunder from the heavens and a crashing of tablets of stone. There is only one word that matters, you say. And that is for living by, not for using as a membership card. Love one another, you say, as unreservedly as I have loved you. Gracious one, forgive us. Forgive us our lack of grace towards others and ourselves. Wise one, teach us to distinguish lasting truth from long-held tradition which may have outlived its time. Generous one, when we are tempted to build barriers to keep others out, prompt us instead to open our hearts to let you and others in passionate and passionate one who loved us into being who showed us in a human life how much love costs and what it can achieve help us to let go of our hatred and fear and dare to live our lives in love. Lord our God, our prayers, our worship, our lives, our love, we offer again to you. Amen. Our first reading today comes from Judges chapter 16 reading from verse 6. So Delilah said to Samson, Please tell me what makes you so strong. If someone wanted to tie you up and make you helpless, how could he do it? Samson answered, If they tie me up with seven new bowstrings that are not dried out, I'll be as weak as anybody else. So the Philistine kings brought Delilah seven new bowstrings that were not dried out, and she tied Samson up. She had some men waiting in another room, so she shouted, Samson, the Philistines are coming! But he snapped the bowstrings just as thread breaks when fire touches it, so they still did not know the secret of his strength. Delilah said to Samson, Look, you've been making a fool of me and not telling me the truth. Please tell me how someone could tie you up. He answered, if they tie me up with new ropes that have never been used, I'll be as weak as anybody else. So Delilah got some new ropes and tied him up. And then she shouted, Samson, the Philistines are coming. The men were waiting in another room, but he snapped the ropes off his arms like thread. Delilah said to Samson, You're still making a fool of me and not telling me the truth. Tell me how someone could tie you up. 
Well, he answered, if you weave my seven locks of hair into a loom and make it tight with a peg, I'll be as weak as anybody else. Delilah then lulled him to sleep, took his seven locks of hair and wove them into the loom. She made it tight with a peg and shouted, Samson, the Philistines are coming. But he woke up and pulled his hair loose from the loom. So she said to him, how can you say you love me when you don't mean it? You've made a fool of me three times and you still haven't told me what makes you so strong. She kept on asking him day after day. He got so sick and tired of her nagging him about it that he finally told her the truth. My hair has never been cut, he said. I have been dedicated to God as a Nazarite from the time I was born. If my hair were cut, I would lose my strength and be as weak as anybody else. When Delilah realised that he had told her the truth, she sent a message to the Philistine kings and said, Come back just once more, he has told me the truth. Then they came and brought the money with them. Delilah lulled Samson to sleep in her lap and then called a man who, was, who cut his hair off. Then she began to torment him, for he had lost his strength. Then she shouted, Samson, the Philistines are coming. He woke up and thought, I'll get loose and go free, as always. He did not know that the Lord had left him. The Philistines captured him and put his eyes out. They took him to Gaza, chained him with bronze chains, and put him to work grinding at the mill in the prison. Amen. Our Gospel reading today comes from John chapter 4, beginning at verse 7. A Samaritan woman came to draw some water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink of water. His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The woman answered, You are a Jew and I am a Samaritan, so how can you ask me for a drink? Jews will not use the same cups and bowls that Samaritans use. Jesus answered, If only you knew what God gives and who it is that is asking you for a drink, you would ask him and he would give you life-giving water. Sir, the woman said, You haven't got a bucket and the well is deep. Where would you get that life-giving water? It was our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well. He and his sons and his flocks all drank from it. You don't claim to be greater than Jacob, do you? Jesus answered, All those who drink this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring, which pr will provide him with life-giving water and give him eternal life. Sir, the woman said, Give me that water, then I will never be thirsty again, nor will I have to come here to draw water. Amen. This week we celebrated International Women's Day. This is a global day celebrating the social, economic, cultural and political achievements of women. The day also marks a call to action for accelerating women's equality. Something that the two women in our Bible readings today would probably have more than supported. You see, the women in the Bible are an interesting bunch. They appear to be split into two distinct camps. There's the good and then there's the bad. They are either saints or sinners, virtuous or vicious, victorious or victims pure or immoral. That is if they're not completely overlooked. The two women in our readings today were certainly not overlooked, although sadly neither of them have ever really been accepted on the saintly side of this divide. Rather, they're usually used as examples of sinners. The first for our greed and traitorous behaviour, and the second, the Samaritan woman, 
for her perceived lifestyle choices. As although not heard in our reading today, the New Testament story continues with Jesus telling the Samaritan woman, Go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replies. And Jesus says to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you've had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. Five husbands. Well, that must mean she was a bad woman, making improper choices, especially considering the man that she's living with at that moment is not her husband. But maybe we need to stop and look at these stories again. Look at them through fresh eyes. Let's start by listening again to the first woman's experience, but from her side this time. You'll know his name. He was a judge of Israel. He was famous. You'll know my name too, but I won't tell you yet. I want you I want to tell you about the other women in his life, whose names are not recorded. Firstly, there was his mother. Typically, we are told her husband's name, but not hers. But it was to her that the angel first came. The angel told her that she would have a son. A son whose work would be to rescue Israel from their enemies. She was given strict instructions as to what she should eat and drink during her pregnancy. She was told to raise her son to take vows, to be set apart to serve God. The second woman in his life was his wife. Again, not named. His parents disapproved of the marriage as she was a Philistine. At the wedding feast, her bridegroom taunts the young men of the village with a riddle and a bet. Unable to answer it, the young men of the village threatened to burn the bride and her family. Fearful for her life, the bride pleads with her husband to tell her the answer to the riddle. At first, he refuses. But after listening to her cries for seven days, he tells her the answer. When she shares the answer with the village, he accuses her of being unfaithful to him and abandons her. She is then given to the husband's best man. The third woman in the story is his wife's sister. When the bridegroom decides he wants to go back to his wife, her father refuses to let him and offers him another of his daughters instead. The bridegroom refuses the offer and set fires to the villagers' corn harvest. And when the villagers discover what has happened, they kill the bride's sister and burn down her father's house. The fourth woman, we're told in the story, is a prostitute whom the bridegroom sleeps with in Gaza. The Philistines in the city find out he is there and hope to surprise him and kill him. But he leaves the city at midnight, taking the city gates with him. So far, four unnamed women in the bridegroom's story. And knowing that he was a judge in Israel for 20 years, it's likely, given what we know about him, there were many more. Finally, the fifth woman in the story. That's me. Have you guessed my name yet? Remember that this story is told as a faith history story. Faith history related by Jews to encourage the Jewish nation. I have very bad press. This man told me that he was in love with me. When our rulers found this out, they wanted me to trick him so that they could over him, overpower him. I tried. He was cunning and he was arrogant. He told me lie after lie. He made me look a fool. I nagged him and nagged him and he finally, possibly for the first time in his life, told the truth. We had him. 
I did what I had to do. And at last he was captured and imprisoned. My name is written down in history as an enemy of Israel. I destroyed one of their heroes. I put, I put paid to his violence and his appalling behaviour towards women once and for all. Having heard my story, how do you judge me? By now, you've hopefully remembered my name. I am the woman who got the truth out of this man. I am Delilah. And his name? His name was Samson. This version might appear shocking to you. For you see, once upon a time, not that long ago actually, this rambling religious folktale about the Jewish prophet Samson would have been as well known as the stories of modern day superheroes like Batman and Superman and Spider-Man. Like them, Samson had his unique superpower, his great physical strength. But he was more than that, for he was a man of God. And thus there was no way that he could be in the wrong. So this strong man, this superhero, must therefore have been duped. Duped by a conniving foreign woman, Delilah. This is, after all, a Jewish tale preserved in Jewish Holy Scripture for Jewish readers, who would have no difficulty believing the worst of the hated Philistines. The social and political context, however, is important here when it comes to understanding who the saints and sinners were. For the Jews and the Philistines were deadly enemies. For 40 years, Judah had been under the Philistine rule. And Samson is introduced to the reader before his conception, never mind his birth, as the divinely appointed hero who would defeat his enemies, and restore the people's freedom. But when we listen to this story from a different perspective, considering it from the woman's point of view, when we do that, then Delilah, maybe she stops being a vill villainous traitor and becomes an intelligent woman in an impossible situation, doing the best she can for herself and her people. We are told that Samson was in love with Delilah, which, on past form, possibly means simply that he wanted and was determined to have her. There is no suggestion that his feelings were reciprocated. Delilah, a mere woman, was under pressure from both Samson and from the Philistine leaders, who saw Samson's infatuation with one of their womenfolk as an opportunity to bring him down. Delilah was offered a vast amount of money to betray him. Why would she not accept it? How could she not accept it? It was her patriotic duty to bring Samson down. So Delilah does as she is told. And after two failed attempts, she gets the truth out of Samson that shaving his head, thus causing him to break his Nazarite vows, would bring an end to his supernatural strength. And she has no hesitation in doing what she has to do. Today, the story of the Philistine woman, Delilah, is set alongside that of the unnamed Samaritan woman, whom Jesus met at the well. Once again, we are challenged to put aside our perceptions and see the humanity in someone who would have been regarded as below contempt by her own people, the Samaritans, for her immoral lifestyle. And certainly by any normal Jewish man. And Jesus was not any normal Jewish man, for he saw through her right into her soul. He saw the hurt and the pain that this woman carried. 
And although it was easy to jump to conclusions about her living an immoral lifestyle, after all, she had had five husbands, maybe we're wrong. Maybe we should think again. Maybe she has had five husbands because they had died. Or maybe, like Samson's first wife, they had been tossed aside. True, the man she was living with now was not her husband. But we don't know the circumstances behind that. Therefore, what gives us the right to judge her? Listen again to what Jesus says. He says, you are right when you have ha say you have had, you have no husband. The fact is, you've had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Can you hear any condemnation in what he says to the woman? Or is it simply a statement of fact? In truth, the entire account has nothing to do with finger pointing. Rather, Jesus needed what she had to give him, a drink of water, and he knew that her life would be transformed by what he could offer her, a fresh start in life and a renewed sense of her own worth. So what do you and I have to learn from these two stories today? Maybe it's not what we thought at the beginning. Maybe rather than examples of good and bad, virtuous or villain, what these stories are simply telling us is don't judge a book by its cover. Maybe they're telling us that we should not be living with an us and those others divide in our life reminding us that even the best of us have made mistakes and the worst of us. Well, maybe instead of judging people, we should be trying to understand them, trying to put ourselves in their shoes, to consider what choices we would have made if we were in Delilah's position or that of the Samaritan woman. Or if we lived the life of the man down the street who hurt his wife by cheating on her. Or the woman who got caught drunk driving. Or better still, maybe we should just accept people as Jesus does. Yes, even the broken and damaged. For aren't we all? But Jesus saw more than that. He saw he sees people who can and should be loved, just as they are, just where they are, because that is probably the place where they, most, where they are most thirsty, where they are in the most need for the water of eternal life. There's a saying that I believe should be written on our hearts, and it goes, walk a day in my shoes, Feel my pain, loss, sadness, guilt, remorse, and the heartache, and then I dare you to judge me. We can be so ready to judge, to put people in categories. Samson, the superhero, Delilah, the villain, the Samaritan woman, oh, she had to be a woman of ill repute, and those who shunned her, totally correct. But that's not our job. We are not called to be judge, jury and executioner. No, we're simply called to follow in Christ's footsteps. To love our neighbour as ourselves. And just imagine what a wonderful world we would live in if we all did just that. If we loved God and loved each other. If we forgave others for their mistakes as much as we do ourselves. Then maybe, to steal a quote from the great Louis Armstrong, we could just think to ourselves and imagine what a wonderful world it would be. Praise God and Amen.
And now we bring our prayers for others and for ourselves. Living God, we have come to know you in Christ, who renounced the way of violence, who spent his life breaking down barriers, who told us to love not just our neighbours, but enemies and strangers and those with whom we most profoundly disagree. He came to bring peace on earth, and still wars are being fought in his name, and communities divided, and people excluded from the fellowship of the table that should be open to all. We are part of whatever it is that keeps going wrong in this world of ours and of yours. So that good intentions turn sour, good people hurt others without meaning to, and lasting peace never quite takes hold. And so, we cannot pray for others or for the healing of the broken world without asking first that we might be healed of our brokenness and set free from the fear that causes hatred and division. We pray for lands laid waste by conflict, for families divided and friendships broken, for churches squabbling over doctrine and buildings, while hungry people remain unfed, sick ones untended, strangers unwelcomed, and sad ones devoid of cheer. We pray for victims of physical violence and of emotional abuse, grieving as we do so for the hurts that cause one person to treat another in this way. And we pray, sometimes without words, because there are no words, and because you know already what needs to be said and what needs to be done to fulfill your purposes of love. And so in a moment's silence, we bring our thoughts, our prayers. Lord, in your mercy, hear us and heal us all. Amen. Let us come now and dedicate ourselves, all that we are and all we have, to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, you have given us each a unique set of gifts physical health and strength to some, to others wit and cleverness. Some of us are born leaders. Some prefer to follow. Some of us are good with words. Others speak through our actions. Help us to use our gifts for good and not ill. May we use our strength to help other people, not to hurt them our minds to enlighten, not to deceive, our words to serve the truth and not to distort it, to heal and not harm. We give back to you the gifts that you have given us. Help us to use them well. Amen. And hear us now, Lord God, as we bring all our prayers together with the words that Jesus taught us as we say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. 
Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen.
as we close our worship and step out into the world, may we follow the one in whom the truth can be trusted. May we know God's peace, Jesus' love and the Spirit's blessing. And may we go in peace, go in joy, and may the blessing of God the Father, Son and Holy Spirit be upon us, those we love and those we should love, today, tomorrow and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.